Dan, Dan. And he's gone. So send him back.
Gordon brought his family. Ah, that's better. Ah, it's kind of dreary outside, but we're going to brighten things up with our worship this morning. But first, a few uh, announcements. A Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving offering is within $1,700 of our uh, goal. So if you haven't given yet, uh, please uh, make that effort before next Sunday. We'll close it out next Sunday. The uh, Living Nativity After Party is on uh, Sunday, January 16th. But if you would like to come, whether you were in the Nativity or not, or helped with it in any way, we need you to sign up. And there is a sign-up table just to the left as you go out the two doors from the worship center. And uh, on the back ledge are still some poinsettias. So if you uh, ordered a poinsettia, paid for a poinsettia, you may take your poinsettia home. Or if you're the last one out, t out today and there's still poinsettias, you can take them all home. So. <laughs> So uh, that's, that's where we are on that. Uh, Pastor Phil is not with us this morning. His uh, family was uh, exposed to COVID last week while they were uh, celebrating Christmas with family. So he'll be with us digitally in a little while. He has recorded his sermon, so uh, we'll still have his sermon this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can worship you, and we lift up our worship to you this morning in a way, and we just hope you accept it. We thank you, Lord, for each one that's here. In thy name we pray. Amen. If you'd stand and join me in singing to God be the glory. All right, so this is the 2nd of January. Good morning again. And so this is the time of year when people make resolutions. You know what resolutions are? What are they? Goals, right? Promises that you make to yourself to maybe do things better, right? Maybe get a little skinnier, 
Maybe spend more time with family, maybe not eat so much, and then you get a little skinnier, right? What are some things kids might want to do? Get better grades, learn to ride a bike, play the guitar, make a new friend, stuff like that. All right, well, I've been thinking about this really hard ever since Phil said you have to do the children's message on Sunday. And so I'm thinking about resolutions, and I have come up with, I think, the list of resolutions that is guaranteed for a better 2022. You want to say them with me? Everyone, raise your right hand. Here we go. Okay, come on. Get in, get in on it now, because if you don't, it's not my fault. Okay? <laughs> All right, here we go. We're going to say, I state your name. Okay, you ready? I state your name. All right? Promise to lie, cheat, swear, and steal more than I did last year. Are you in? Yes? Maybe? No? Okay, well, let me explain. Let me explain, okay? So the lying is going to be lying back and relaxing more. We can do that, right? We're not going to worry about this stuff in the past. Can we do anything about it? No. It's gone, right? We can learn from it. Can we do anything about the future? We can make plans, but we don't know what God has in store for us. So is worrying about it a good thing? Just waste a bunch of time. So we're going to stay focused right here and today and kind of relax and enjoy where we are, right? And what's happening around us. i got a couple of verses for you. In Ecclesiastes 8, 7, it says, Since no man knows the future, who can tell what will happen? And then in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. So the Lord knows what he's doing. He's got plans to prosper us and not to harm us and to give us a good future and hope. So God's in charge. Lay back and relax. Or excuse me, lie back and relax. Okay? So that's where we're going to be doing some lying. All right, we're going to cheat failure. Okay? Not cheating on a test. We're going to cheat some failure. So don't be afraid to try something new, like riding that bike or playing the guitar or standing up and speaking in front of people or some really hard math problems, okay? Failure's where we learn stuff, those great life lessons that God's trying to teach us. Um, the swearing. The swearing. We're going to swear to do our best. Can we do that? Yes, we can. If we try every time to do our best, nobody can give us any trouble over that, even if we fail. So always give your best effort in every situation. And then the last one, we're going to steal some stuff. You ready? We're going to steal some time for God, okay? We're going to steal some time for him every day. We're going to invest in developing that relationship, reading our Bible, talking to him, asking him questions, right? Talking about him with other people. Maybe um, you want to read the Bible this year. That's a great plan to start right now in January, reading that whole Bible. And there's lots of places you can go to get, you know, how to do that and what to read. Um, how about choosing to make Jesus the Lord of your life? If you've never done that, what a great way to start 2022 with the Lord in charge of what you're doing. Or maybe you have asked him to be the Lord of your life, but you've never been baptized or joined this church so those are some great things you can do that would steal you some time with God, but also make this a better year. So I promise you that if you lie, cheat, swear, and steal a little bit more in 2022, the way I've suggested you do it, it will be a much better year. Are you in? I think we can do it. All right, let's pray about it, okay? Father, we thank you so much that you help us to lie back and relax, to cheat failure, to swear to do our best, and to steal some time to be with you every day. Help us to do all of those things. Thank you for being in control so we don't have to worry about anything. We love you, and we thank you for hearing our prayers, and we thank you for this new start, for a new year, to um, move in a direction that you are guiding us. We pray this in your son's holy name. And they all said, amen. amen. You may make it go back to your families. Good morning. And <laughs> and Happy New Year. Um, I'm going to invite you in, in just a minute uh, to, to stand. And we're going to uh, sing a few songs together. Um, we're a little thin this morning. I tried to get, uh, I, I was teasing the team earlier. Uh, my son Tyler does a really great job of balancing between here and Cornerstone. Because he still, he still feels like his... Uh, you know, he grew up there, so he tries to balance it. And uh, I told him, I said, man, I really need a drummer. I said, 
you know, I know you've made up your mind, but if you come and drum, I, there might be some money under your pillow. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, college student, I thought that would do it. It, it didn't do it. So uh, God has him there for a reason this morning. <laughs> would you please stand if you're able and, and sing with us? Um, we've got three together, so if any time you feel like you need to sit down, please do. God knows your heart. Uh, keep singing, and um, Happy New Year. I'm not a warrior, I'm too afraid to lose. And I feel unqualified for what you're calling me to do. Lord, with your strength, I've got no excuse, because broken people are exactly who you use. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's day. Give me hope. face my giants with confidence. You took a shepherd boy and made him a king. I'm going to trust you, Lord, and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror because you fight for me. I'll be a champion claiming your Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense so I can face my giants with confidence. Give me faith.
Reading from Psalm 100, used in the NIV version. Shout for joy to the Lord on the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with songs. Know that the Lord is God, it is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pastures. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. The Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I sure wish that I could be there in the worship center with you this morning, but let me tell you why I'm not. Happy New Year, everyone. I sure wish that I could be there in the worship center with you this morning, but let me tell you why I'm not. As so many of you did, our family went and enjoyed the holidays with some of our extended family. Uh, we actually traveled down to, to South Carolina to see my father and some family there. We had a great time, but unfortunately, when all the festivities were over, some of our family members our extended family members tested positive for the COVID virus. And so our immediate family, we are trying to be safe, 
kind of letting some days of quarantine go by and then we'll be tested and hopefully we'll be back with you very soon. So I hope by next Sunday. And so this is also why we're not going to have the Lord's Supper today. I figured since we had the Lord's Supper at our Christmas Eve service, uh, and then this is a month with five Sundays, we would just postpone it until January 9th. But I am glad that you are, are with us for worship today. And those of you who are joining us remotely, kind of like what I'm doing, <clears throat> we're glad that you are part of that as well. Now, for the past several weeks, I've gone back and forth about what I wanted to stay, say here at the start of a new year, because it seems like it ought to be good. But these are still strange times. In one moment, I, I feel like we're beginning to emerge from a two-year cloud that descended on us when the world's first new strain of that coronavirus came out and went global a couple years ago. But on the other hand, it seems like we're still right in the thick of it. Every time we see the light at the end of the tunnel, a new variant comes along and it poses some new set of risks. And even now that we have vaccines and boosters and more knowledge, you, you know, we, we come to the end of the year thinking that things should be wrapping up, but instead we're wondering what kind of surge is gonna follow the holiday festivities. So I guess all this kind of turned my heart towards a message of faith and hope that comes to us to an, through an Old Testament passage that takes place in the time of the judges. Now, let me give you a little historical context for that. Most people know something about Moses leading the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, then leading them to the border of the promised land. And it was Joshua who led, who led the 12 tribes to conquer and settle in the land. And each tribe was given its own geographic area. Now, following Joshua, and we're talking approximately 1300 or so BC, following Joshua, came a rather sad chapter in the history of Israel. There didn't seem to be any strong, godly leader over the whole nation. And the last verse of the book of Judges pretty well uh, wraps this up, summarizing a two to 300 year period. And it says this in Judges 21, 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Or as the King James Version says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that, folks, is a recipe for disaster. Now, during the period of the judges, a familiar cycle is often repeated. The Israelites would turn away from the Lord and they would do evil in his sight. And then God would allow his people to be oppressed by neighboring tribes and nations. In their suffering, in that oppression, the Israelites would cry out to the Lord for help. And then God would raise up a leader who we call a judge. And at least regionally, that person would rise up and deliver them from oppression. And at least temporarily, the people would then return to follow the Lord. And so it was during one of these cycles that we are introduced to Gideon. He was a man from the tribe of Manasseh, whom the Lord chose to deliver his people from the Midianites. Now, what I like about Gideon is that he's a real person just like us. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, in chapter 11, he is listed among the roll call of the faithful heroes, or what we call heroes of the faith. And yet he was an unlikely hero. Faith was something that he had to grow into. He didn't start out as a, as a brave, bold, godly leader during those tumultuous times, but God picked him anyway. And so we're going to take two weeks to dig into his story looking primarily at Judges 6 this week and then Judges chapter 7 next week. And so chapter 6 starts with this verse. 
Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. It was a terrible time, especially for the central tribes of Israel. The neighboring Midianites had infiltrated into their country, raiding their farmland, stealing livestock, driving the Israelites from their homes and from their cities. That which was not stolen was destroyed. And many of the Midianites even began to settle in the Promised Land. And the Israelites were, were helpless to stop them. But the Bible is clear that God's people brought this on themselves. They had turned from the Lord and had begun to worship the idols and the false gods of the Canaanite tribes. The lessons of the Exodus, the teachings of the Ten Commandments, those instructions, those were all but forgotten. So here are some lessons I want to pull out for you from this chapter. The first thing is this. God calls us to an honest assessment of the challenges that we face. In life, there are all sorts of trials and challenges. Some of them, like natural disasters and many diseases, they simply happen because we live in a fallen world. God can certainly teach us things and, and to help us grow through hardships that are not of our making. They simply happen and we learn to trust God through them. And he is with us. But then there are other hardships and challenges that we bring upon ourselves through carelessness, through unwise decisions, through sinful habits. I think of people who have come to me through the years complaining uh, about all the hardships that God has put into their lives. But then I can look at their lifestyle and easily identify how they have undermined their relationships through selfishness or sometimes immorality, or how they have compromised their own health through poor practices, or how they lost their job because of their own dishonesty or laziness, and yet they had the gall to blame God, who clearly has given us instructions to help us avoid all of that. The fact is, God is just waiting to help us out of the pits that we sometimes dig for ourselves. And he calls on us to be honest and humble about it. His goal is not for us to simply have easier lives, but that we would become better people. There's a saying, it goes, if you find yourself in a ditch, stop digging. In a nutshell, that's what the Lord was trying to teach the Israelites. So here's what it says in chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened. You see, God sent a prophet to convict them of their sin even before he raised up a deliverer. And what we find, skipping a little bit ahead up to verse 13, is that in the beginning, even Gideon seemed to blame God for their predicament. He says, if the Lord is with us, why has this happened to us? And he says, the Lord has abandoned us. Well, God was going to help Gideon understand that the suffering in his country was not just some natural happening, but that they had brought it on themselves. Gideon and the nation needed to come to an honest assessment of the challenges that they were facing. Repentance and change was necessary. So let's back up now and see how Gideon is drawn into this story. Judges 6, verses 11 and 12. 
the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abia's right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So out of the blue, an angel, I assume in human form as they usually were, showed up there on the property of Gideon's family. Interestingly enough, he has sat himself under a tree and is watching Gideon work. It's also interesting in this passage how the voice of the angel and the voice of the Lord are kind of blended. Now this is, is common in the Old Testament portrayal of angels. What they're saying really is what God is saying. Gideon, meanwhile, he's threshing wheat, but not out in the open on a spacious plot of hard-packed earth, uh, as would be customary, but rather he's threshing wheat in a wine press, trying to avoid the detection of the Midianites. If they knew he was processing grain, they would come steal it. He hardly looked like a mighty warrior. He doesn't have a sword in his hand. He, he has some sort of threshing broom. He looks more like a scared farmer trying to fly under the radar, resigned to his fate. But here's a lesson for you. God calls us based not on who we are, but on who we can be. God saw something in Gideon that was valuable, but was being neglected. And so God came through the angel, in essence, calling him to be who he was meant to be all along. God often does this. Think about Peter, the disciple of Jesus. He was a pretty fickle follower to begin with. He was famous for saying something profound and then following that up by saying something stupid. He was famous for, for being the bravest of the whole group of disciples, but then also doing something cowardly. It's hardly what we would call rock-like. But in the midst of his waffling, this is what Jesus said to him. Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, that is Petros, the rock. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And Jesus was right about Peter, wasn't he? Peter grew to be a strong leader of the New Testament church, serving Christ until his death as a martyr. That strength. And so it is that Jesus calls us to be what we have yet to become. And he calls us to do things that we have not yet done. He sees our potential as individuals. And folks, he sees our potential as a church. We need to stop selling ourselves short or living in fear of God's high calling. God's got big plans for us in 2022. So why can we have great confidence for the future? Our confidence shouldn't come because we think that we are somehow worthy or we have enough resources in ourselves. Our confidence comes because God is worthy. God is powerful. And so God calls us to depend upon his strength and not our own. Let's go back to the chapter here, Judges 6, verses 14, 15, and 16. It says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. You know, when God called Gideon to the, the task of delivering Israel from the Midianites, he first challenged him to go in the strength you have. But then knowing that Gideon's strength would be nowhere near sufficient, God made it clear that Gideon wouldn't be out there on his own. God went on, to, went on to say, aren't I the one sending you? And I will be with you. 
If the Israelites learned anything from God's work through Gideon, it was that the strength of God is magnified through the weakness of people. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. When we're working for the Lord, no task is too big. 2 Corinthians 12.10 says, For when I am weak, then I am strong. When Jesus called on his disciples to, to feed the 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, they thought he was crazy. But Jesus wasn't expecting them to do it on their own, was he? When Jesus told those same disciples to go into all the world and make more disciples, he wasn't expecting them to do it by their own power or wisdom, he reminded them, I am with you always. So why is it we get so easily discouraged? Why do we give up so fast when we're working for the Lord? Now we're going to come back to this topic next week, but I challenge you to be reviewing in your own life how the Lord has empowered you to do whatever he has called you to do. And some of you are familiar with those experiences in your life. Now, to fill in some of the gaps in my presentation of chapter 6, let me tell you how Gideon's encounter with the angel concludes. Gideon wanted a sign that God was really speaking to him through the, the man sitting under a tree. So he asked for permission to set up a worship offering. The angel agreed. So Gideon went and slaughtered a goat and baked some bread. And after a while, he brought back meat, unleavened bread, and a pot of broth or gravy. And he set it before the angel of the Lord, seemingly as a meal. But the angel told him to set the meat and the bread on a rock and to pour the broth over it. And then the angel got up and he touched the meal with the tip of his staff. Now, without any wood as fuel for an altar, the fire shot up from the rock and consumed the food. And as the flash of fire died down, the angel of the Lord was gone. This helped Gideon understand that it was actually God who had been talking to him. In fact, God continued to talk to him, even that night and in the coming days, even while the angel was gone. So then we come to the, the final point I want to make today. God calls us to be faithful in small things before giving us bigger assignments. Let's go to verses 25 through 27. There in Judges 6. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. We begin to see what the Lord is doing in the life of Gideon. First, Gideon needed to understand the evils of idolatry in the eyes of the Lord. But secondly, God was testing his faith and his obedience on a smaller scale before tackling the issue of the Midianites. If he couldn't stand up to his own people, how could he stand up against the pagan kings and their armies? Gideon was scared, but he was obedient. He tore down the altar to Baal, considered to be one of the greatest of the Canaanite gods, and, and his father had built that altar right there on their own property. He risked the fury of his father and the townspeople who had come to worship there. They probably thought Gideon was going to bring the wrath of Baal down upon them. But when Joash saw what his son had, had done, he stood up for his son Gideon against the townspeople. 
Perhaps he knew in his heart that Baal was only a powerless idol, and his son's courage gave him the courage to stand up for what he knew was right. Well, Gideon passed the test, and he began to win over the hearts of the people. You know, sometimes we may think that God only calls us to gargantuan, miraculous tasks because we read about those things in the Scripture. But God most often works through the smaller, everyday acts of service, of faith, of obedience. Don't neglect the importance of the little things God asks you to do. Zechariah 4.10 says, Who dares despise the day of small things? Because in God's plan, little things lead to bigger things. Little responsibilities lead to bigger responsibilities. Little acts of faith lead to bigger acts of faith. Little blessings lead to bigger blessings. Do you remember the response of the master in the parable of the talents? From Matthew 25, verse 23, he says to his good servant, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will, be, I will put you in charge of many things. First, Gideon was faithful to show leadership in his own family and in his own community. Then God led him to give leadership, both militarily and spiritually, to his whole country. Next week, we're going to look at that in chapter 7. And we're also going to look at how God dealt with Gideon's doubts and what it means for us to, to set out the fleece before God or to seek confirmation from God. But for today, what is the lesson God is trying to teach you? Is God calling you to be honest about the troubles you're facing? Is there something God wants you to repent of? Something God wants you to change so that he can do a greater work in your life. But even if the trials that you're facing are not related to sin, are you willing to acknowledge that you are scared, that you are hurt? It's time to be honest about it and bring it to God. Cry out to him. Or do you sense God is calling you uh, to be something you've never been before or to do something you've never done before. That challenge may be scary, but God sees your potential and he wants you to use that potential for him. Or he may be calling you to put more faith in his power and less faith in your own power. Your confidence is going to grow when you know that you are never alone. God never leaves you nor forsakes you. And he also, as God, never fails. But then finally, I challenge you to be faithful to the everyday, even seemingly menial tasks that God gives you. Be kind to your family. Be honest with your friends. Be generous to somebody who's in need. Speak a word of witness to your neighbor. Offer God your best in the little things, and you will find it will lead to even greater things. You probably don't feel like a hero today, but don't underestimate what God can do through you. He likes to call unlikely heroes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this story of Gideon. I thank you that you worked with him to help his faith to grow. And Gideon was able to give himself to you and to be obedient. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would, you would make your ways clear to us, that you would at least show us what it is in this day, in this decision we face, what it is you want us to do what kind of person you want us to be, and that we would be faithful. And Lord, as we serve you, help us also to know of your constant presence, because it is the promise you gave from the very beginning of your word to the very 
end, that you never leave us nor forsake us. And so, Heavenly Father, we come before you knowing that you are real, knowing that you are loving, knowing that you are powerful, and that you have called us into your family. We thank you for that privilege and that honor. In Jesus' name, amen. A decision or something you need to talk to one of the staff about, feel free to come and either pray on the steps or at the kneeling bench or talk to a staff member who will be here. Let's stand together as we sing. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for being 